My name is Jacek Bartosza. Welcome to Strategy and Future. So, hello everyone. My name is Albert Świdziński. This is another Strategy and Future podcast. And um, with me today is Mr. Greg Melcher, a very special guest. We're very glad to have you here, Greg. And Greg, just to introduce, uh, just to introduce him, he is the Chief Operations Officer for the New Generation Warfare Center. Um, Greg used to be Vice President of the National Security Analysis, leading the National Security Analysis at Johns Hopkins. Uh, applied Physics Laboratory. Uh, he has 27 years experience working for the U.S. Navy, uh, where for the, pa- for the last eight of those years, he served as a set of increasingly responsible positions in the senior executive service. Um, again, Greg, great to have you here. Thank you for being with us. Uh, thanks, Albert. Happy to, happy to do it. Looking forward to having a conversation. So there are two topics we'll be, we'll be discussing today. First, Greg is going to give us his view um, on both... Uh, conventional uh, presence of the United States and NATO on, on the alliance's eastern flank. And then we will sort of coast to nuclear affairs, the INF treaty, and everything in between. So, Greg, take it, take it away. Okay, great. So, uh, this talk is based on uh, a panel that I was on at, at a London School of Economics conference that was held uh, adjacent to the uh, NATO summit back in December, actually occurred on December 5th. And I was on a panel that was chaired by Sir Richard Barons, who's a pretty distinguished guy, retired four-star UK officer. Uh, It was a very interesting discussion there. So I think what I'll do is I kind of start through what I had to say there, and uh, we can then uh, uh, go on from that. So Sounds good. So I wanted to kind of start with, you know, and part of that background you talked about, I've spent... uh, about a decade, uh, I'm now three or four years out of date, but I spent about a decade focusing on how to counter China's anti-access air denial strategies in the Far East. Uh, but now I've been, the last three years or so, I've been with, uh, for a while with the Potomac Foundation and now with the New Generation Warfare Center, where we're focused on helping NATO, EU, and partner nations to defend against states waging new generation warfare. Uh, In our view, this type of warfare is a seamless integration of both kinetic, which you see from time to time, and non-kinetic actions, which are happening all the time. And it's implemented across the full spectrum of diplomatic, economic, political, and military security. Um, The past three years, our primary method of research into these challenges has been the conduct of over 20 regionally focused operational strategic simulation type activities. And I'll note that uh, I think three of those actually took place in Poland, uh, although it's been a few years since we've done anything there. Um, so first, some comments, uh, you know, based on this work, um, then, you know, what I've done in these regional simulations. And then, like I said, we'll, we'll get into maybe some nuclear technology and, uh, and the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. Um, so okay. first, I want to talk a little bit about my perspective. And, and if, if we were uh, in a PowerPoint brief or something, I'd show you a chart of those uh, strategic simulations we've conducted the last three years. And you'd see they go all the way from Svalbard in the northern Arctic, well above the Arctic Circle, all the way down through this long front with Russia and uh, would conclude with the Eastern Mediterranean, where we just did an event uh, in uh, in November that was hosted uh, at a NATO activity in Crete. And so looking at that, you know, I think, you know, people haven't thought as much about it, but, you know, the NATO, it expanded its borders after the, after the Soviet Union fell without really thinking through what it meant to defend it, uh, at least not in the way we were prepared to do during the, core war, uh, during the Cold War. That defense during that time, and now I'm talking about up until 1990, was well understood and well pa- practiced through the 80s through a series of reforger exercises, which, by the way, I think they're the, the current effort of uh, Defender 2020 is enough to try and get back to that, but we're not there yet. Uh, following the Cold War, it's understandable then that some believed we had entered an era of everlasting peace and we would not see Russia as a threat again. Um, but now we've determined that Russia is not a friend, has invaded neighboring states, 
and continues to actively and aggressively attack our liberal democracies. Subsequently, there's much to do. Good efforts are underway with the enhanced forward presence in the Baltic states and Poland. Uh, then there's the tailored force presence in the Black Sea region, although additional focus should be placed to the south in Romania and to the Balkans. In addition, we should do more to exploit new opportunities now that it's clear that Sweden and Finland will not be neutral, which I believe is targeted at reducing the U.S. ability to reinforce Europe. Additional efforts to respond to these new generation warfare activities include more U.S. troops in Poland, along with Poland's increase in force structure, the implementation of the package of measures on Black Sea security, Romania's commitment to the 2% investment of their uh, GDP into defense, the recent 30-30-30 uh, exercise in Norway, <clears throat> excuse me, and the upcoming Defender 20 exercise in Central Europe. These are all steps in the right direction, and they help deterrence. However, let's be clear. None of these actions alone, or even combined, would be sufficient to stop a determined attack by current Russian forces, such as the recently established First Guards Tank Army. I don't see NATO making the political decisions or NATO forces being able to move to the fight before Russia can achieve key objectives such as gaining strategic depth around its borders. The result would be the need to remove Russian forces occupying NATO territory, something that is possible but requires quite a bit of political will. <clears throat> Excuse me. This leads to the need to enhance military mobility and supporting infrastructure, which has never been more important than today, but so far it's an area of much talk without enough action. Uh, this is an area important enough that some even recommend that investments in mobility should be considered as a contribution towards the NATO 2% target. I concur with this idea, but wish to say that 2% is a very crude metric. What is needed is a carefully performed net assessment of what NATO EU and partner nation countries truly need in order to ensure deterrence or the ability to prevail if deterrence fails. If so, the allies must appropriately spend whatever is needed on a carefully balanced package of acquisition, training, and readiness <clears throat> that creates a compelling deterrent in a coordinated, fully inoperable way across the alliance. Note that our adversary enjoys the benefits of such a fully integrated capability and can see both the challenges to see this integration across the allies and is exploiting the opportunity to drive wedges that prevent such integration. So you might say, why is this important? Well, it is first to recognize that Russia has built a substantial and capable force along the front with NATO. It's not just troops and tanks, but robust advanced artillery. To that, they have added a substantial missile force to include theater range capabilities that violate the INF Treaty, both tactical and operational strategic advanced air defense systems, and sophisticated electronic warfare capabilities. Of course, they will continue to employ all their advanced cyber capabilities from the GRU and the Internet Research Agency, along with many other forms of hybrid warfare being employed today in their attempt to manipulate and disrupt Western liberal democracies. <clears throat> I believe we need to view what was once a flank as now the new front, and it's quite a long one. It's that whole border I just described, from Svalbard all the way down to the Eastern Mediterranean. This is both a blessing and a curse. And factually, it's a nine times increase in the force to space ratio that we faced during the Cold War. In those days, we only had to worry about that inner German border, and all the Allies knew exactly what they were supposed to do. There are maps and publications one can view today to show who would be fighting and where. While we now have this long come in front from Svalbard to the Eastern Mediterranean and Syria, we do not have equally well-defined plans to protect it. Do we know which ally is going to fight on which part of this long front like we did during the Cold War? But such a long front does offer some advantages. Russia does possess some potent forces and new advanced capabilities, but they do not have the force structure to defend along that entire border, and that is an advantage that NATO, EU, and partner nations can exploit. In terms of force overall, NATO has numerical superiority if it can get all its reinforcements to the fight and if these forces are ready. All the allies along this front need to understand the challenge each other faces, plan together, and be prepared to take action in a timely, coordinated fashion. So again, I think there's some effort to try and do this, but it's not moving at the pace I think it's needed to truly counter the potential threat. Um, but for example, if Russia appeared to be moving against the Baltics, that could be the perfect time for a large exercise on the border of Finland, 
and other aviation exercise across the northern part of Norway, Sweden, and Finland who practice regularly. Uh, perhaps a large training event jointly with Ukraine, a concentration of NATO maritime forces in the eastern Mediterranean or into the Black Sea. As mentioned earlier, the Defender Series will help to move forward in this type of training exercise, enhancing deterrence. A maritime example might be uh, U.S. SSGNs, that's the former ballistic missile submarines. We have four of them that have been converted into Tomahawk missile shooters. So have a one of those visibly surfacing in the North Atlantic and Eastern Med, similar to what occurred in the Far East in 2010, where we had three come up in different locations uh, around China. In fact, the sort of message this offers last month in a CBS video news clip had the USS Florida, one of those SSGNs, with over 150 Tomahawk missiles operating on a seat or mission in the Eastern Mediterranean, well publicized. It was on the news. Everybody saw it. Mm-hmm. While Russia have, has formidable capabilities, having this many theater-range t- Tomahawk missiles available that can be launched from an unknown location in the Mediterranean, reaching many areas along this long front, provides another form of deterrence. So there's many things that you can do to begin to counter them and really take advantage of the length of the front, where I think it does play to the Allies' actions if they operate in a coordinated way. I'm not saying that they do as much mm-hmm. as they should, and that's an area of concern. A big if. Yeah, that's yeah. a big if. Uh, mm-hmm. Are we all on the same page? Are we all working together? Do we have interoperable systems that allow us all fight and, and uh, work together? Have we practiced any of this? Mm-hmm. So Defender 2020 is a great first step, but it's just an initial step. It's not It's not the long-term answer. So Understood. So turning a little bit to uh, Hybrid warfare activities, cyber and fake news are being used to exploit the seams in our liberal democracies. Certainly, you've seen it in the United States attacking our election process. We need to recognize that these attacks are just as potentially damaging to freedom as a missile or torpedo and respond appropriately. Russia has integrated all its interagency into one building two miles from the Kremlin. What steps has each NATO EU country taken to integrate their interagency or interinstitutionals? to be prepared to respond to this type of tax underway. Well, NATO is a defensive alliance prepared to react to an Article 5 attack, we have reached the point where this standard needs to apply to non-kinetic activity. If it is placing at risk our liberal democracy, we must treat such activities as a form of warfare and respond accordingly. And I can tell you from all those simulations we've done, we almost always play some degree of non-kinetic activity. Sometimes there's a day or two of, in a simulation war game where there actually is no shooting. It's all working with all the interagencies. And I have to say, for the most part, most Western democracies that are very nascent state of trying to get them to work together and understand the problem and realize that they will make decisions. They will have to take actions in non-military agencies across their country to be effective and to be, to be able to do deterrence mm-hmm. or be able to respond if they're attacked. And many of them have a long way to go, much less seeing them to communicate across all 29 NATO nations or between NATO and EU or NATO, EU and partner nations. So this leads to another, I think, key thing to to realize is that fundamentally, after years of saying we need to do more with less, we now have to do more with more. There is a great power competition among near peers and who is the peer and who is the near can be of considerable debate. But the potential type of high end warfare hmm. is in addition to an ongoing counterinsurgency challenge that has not gone away, it's something we've been doing for the last 20 years. We can't stop those efforts to focus on high, high end warfare now exclusively. They're still happening. Any, any you know, belief there's a peace dividend that we once spoke of all the time, particularly in the 90s, it's over. It's gone. It's, there's nothing left there. And unfortunately, in many countries, uh, there's a lot of very, um, let's just say, people, wishful thinking people who would love that dividend to still be here, but it just doesn't exist. That's not the world we live in today. I would imagine this also, I'm sorry for interrupting. I would imagine those, those people, they are, I would imagine, further west, which, which, prove, which again, you know, is a proof and point of, of diverging interests within NATO or could be considered as one, which... It's also probably something that will be hardly amenable or difficult to amend at least. Well, I don't. I don't think people are fully thinking that way. I think. I think we have, you know, coming from the NATO summit. You know, a takeaway I had was that there's some country to the east, Poland, Romania, the Baltic states, who are close mm-hmm. to and see the threat. 
uh, not even in them uh, in NATO, but Finland, Sweden, who are very aware of what's going on. And then there's the traditional NATO countries who are to the west from the old times of the inter-German border. And, you know, so you have French and, and Italy and Spain. And, uh, you know, I, I think even in Germany as well. They, they, I mean, I don't think they really want to face up to what they ha- what's going on here. They just sort of like the sweep sure. under the table. Can't we all just get along? But if anybody's a student of history sure. and looked at how Russia thinks, how they behaves, you know that this little hiatus for 10 or 15 years was just that. It wasn't going to stay. This is their nature. This is the way they think. This is the way they operate. This is how it's the way it's been for hundreds of years. And, uh, and uh, sure. um, you know, they, they need to have kind of a wake-up call and say, hey, look, this is, this is not a game. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's not, it's not right. I mean, you've signed, you, you expanded NATO. You signed a treaty. They're part of it. Protecting the East is just mm-hmm. as important as the West. I hear too many people keep talking about the Eastern flank, and I keep going, if that's the flank, where's the front? It's the front. Sure. <laughs> and also, I would imagine it's rather symbolic that because the, the overall commentary uh, and the aftermath of the summit was that it was a, was a successful one and we avoided any major disasters happening. But it tells a lot about the state of the alliance when we're a lack of, uh, as long as it's not a train wreck, it's a success, right? This also, this also tells a story of the, of the situation right now in a way. Yeah. So I, th- I think, uh, you know, I don't know what the right answer is. I think that there almost needs to be a, an Eastern Alliance inside of NATO that kind of gets together and says, Hey, here's what we're facing. Uh, you know, you know, for example, I, I do a fair amount of work for the Romanians and uh, you know, they're, you know, unlike, at least in, in Poland's case, um, you know, you have a lot of attention to the problem. You have the EFP battle groups, you have the additional U S troops, you have a lot of recognition that there's a problem and you're surrounded by friends. Think about it. Really, the whole the whole Baltic Sea is really under the control of the West if, if we want it to be. All you have, the only adversary you have there potentially is simply the Russians in Kaliningrad and St. Petersburg. Otherwise, everybody else is on the same team. So the, Balt- the Baltic Sea and that side, you really have a better situation. But let's go down to Romania. Look at the Black Sea. You have the instability mm-hmm. of Ukraine. You have Georgia, which has been invaded some parts of it by Russia. Uh, you, know, you have Turkey, which will not will do nothing at all. Not only Turkey will not do anything, but they they are they will openly advocate that Romania needs to stop doing all that. <laughs> and then you look at the level sure. you look at the level of Russian influence in the Balkans. Mm-hmm. So you have some very unstable regions there that you know people don't really realize how bad it could be. And, uh, and at least, you know, the people who live there do. They know what the problems are, but, and they can see the level of Russian influence across the region. Mm-hmm. What terrifies me is when Jacek mentioned uh, a while ago uh, the complexity of the Black Sea and potential for amphibious landings. And uh, all those, I- I've never heard of those islands, those little islands that are there by the Danube Delta. Uh, and, and what terrifies me that there is a very good chance that there, is, there are people in the West who are interested in, in military affairs and in NATO, and they have no idea about the finer details of, uh, of the northern, of Baltic states, of Poland's defense. This is, this is a, a terrifying thought that, that yeah. there, there is so little knowledge uh, yeah, yeah. I think it's, about the threats in the Black Sea. Yeah, yeah no, that's true. Now, we've, we've had a number of events down there. We did a simulation that was, uh, uh, we did actually did a Baltic maritime simulation, but we recently did what I would call a uh, Black Sea maritime simulation. We looked at the potential uh, paths to go there. We also uh, hosted a European American security dialogue in partnership with our, uh, we have an NGO partner in Romania, the New Strategy Center, together with the uh, the uh, Ministry of Defense and the Chief of Defense. And the, uh, it was actually held on the Murray ship. Um, and we actually went down the Danube, and then part of it, we all got out on small boats and actually went out into the narrow areas of the Delta so that people would have a better understanding of that region. Um, and uh, I think a lot of eyes got opened, uh, not just what's there, but also what can what sort of warfare can be detected on a river the size of, of the Danube. It's a, quite a big river. There's a lot of activity going on there, and the the uh, probably the best forces and, and military forces from a naval point of view in Romania are the riverine ships. But at the same time, the Russia mm-hmm. have a, a pretty good capability there as well. Uh, they can move can move from the Caspian through some canals and then be into the Black Sea and potentially go into those deltas. 
And also, uh, I don't know, can you hear me? Yes, I think, yes. I think it's good, yeah. And also, uh, for example, amphibious landings on those uh, those tiny on those tiny islands, right near near to near to Ru- Romanian coast, establishing K two A D bubbles, and it's uh, all of a sudden the, the the theater becomes much less accessible for the for the alliance forces, right? Yeah, is- yeah. Well, there's a there's a small island there. Uh, I think it's called Serpent Island, and um, it's a Serpent yeah, Island. Yeah, yeah, it's just it's actually uh, part of Moldova. I believe, or no, is it, it's either, it's not Romanian. I, I, I can't remember which country actually owns it, but it's an easy, you know, it's an easy island, it sits up about a hundred, uh, hundred meters off the, off the water. It's a high rocky soil. It'd be a, a great place to uh, set up an S 300 or S 400 type system. And uh, which the missile range would put you completely recover all the way to Bucharest without any problem at all. On the other hand, it's a fixed target. It's mm. also a fixed target. You know, it's gonna. You really can't. You really sure. can't hide. So it wouldn't uh, wouldn't be that hard to attack it. But if you had uh, really good air defense weapons there, as well as electronic warfare capabilities, it, it could you know really help uh, continue to expand the ATOD capability. Although let's not you know roll under the the table here. The the systems that are in. Um, I was going to say Kaliningrad. I'm sorry. In. Um, um, Crimea. Crimea, yes, that's what I was looking for. Thanks. Uh, the system in Crimea are pretty good, and the ranges from there are pretty far. Now, the question, of course, is, you know, which missiles do they have? There? Turkish Straits. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I'm sure. just saying, you know, you have to be, you have to look at it in terms of there's a system and its capability, and if it's stocked with and it has a quantity of the best missiles, you have a great range. But, uh, you know, I don't know exactly what the real order of battle is. I mean, if, if the, the longer range missiles are more difficult to operate, they're, they cost a lot more money. How many do they actually have there? So, the, you know, you have mm-hmm. to look at, well, that system could defend out to 100, 100 kilometers with a certain set of missiles, but also can do 500 kilometers with a different set of missiles. So what do they really have there? What have they actually invested in? Mm-hmm. Uh, some of that, I don't know. Maybe intelligence agencies do, but I don't. Sure. Um, going back to what, you, what you've said, uh, it did seem like the NATO forces at the, very, at the first stages of, of, of any potential conflict in the Baltics would be facing a very much uphill battle that we would rather have to force on surge capabilities and uh, uh, very much fighting back uh, what has been lost in the early stages. Yeah. Um, well, uh, uh-huh. you know, a couple of comments on that. Um, so some of these, there's a tendency, I think, for many countries to pull back and try and defend their capital. In the Baltic states, um, there is, uh, you know, the terrain is actually quite defendable along the borders. So one way to do that is to have a strategy of defending very vigorously at the border and then making them fight their way through you. And that could that mm-hmm. could take something which, uh, well, in the RAND simulation that was done for, you know, I guess now three or four years ago, they said it would, you know, and. 24 or 48 to 72 hours they could basically overrun everything and be occupying most of the baltic states mm. and that and that's a you know if there really is no defense and you didn't have the fp battalions and if you don't defend at the border and if you don't do all kinds of nasty tricks which are possible if you really yeah, think outside the box of how to slow them down how to you know which you know do you blow bridges do you jam bridges do you uh, you know, to you put all kinds of mining out there. There's a lot of things that you could do to make it a very difficult day. But if you look at the timelines of what it really takes to get reinforces there in any quantity, if you look at the type of NAR, you know, A2AD type of bubble that Russia can construct, both from their strategic assets at fixed sites, as well as what goes with their brigades and battalions and these various armies, you know, the mobile type systems they can set up to move with with the military as it moves, it's going to be very difficult to stop that force from probably achieving their objectives if they were to occupy a fair amount of uh, of the Baltic mm-hmm. states in the timeline that anybody could reinforce it, which means then you're going to have to fight your way back in. And a lot of people have done analysis on this. Uh, Dr. Hoker from the National Defense University just re- released a publication, and he did, I think, some, you know, I, I probably don't agree with actually everything he said, but for the most part, I agree generally with his conclusions of what, what, what would be required, how long it would take, how challenging it would be. And what, what you've said about defending on the border is very interesting, especially if one looks at, um, uh, well, the Operation Atlantic Resolve is one thing and the EFP is another. 
And um, we did we did a little essay uh, at Strategy and Future concerning the um, conventional uh, deterrence in the in the Baltic states, and we looked at the dislocations. Uh, for example, the the current ABCP that is stationed, uh, the parts of which are stationed in uh, in the Baltics, and this is located in Pabrade in in Lithuania in eastern Lithuania, and we we've noted that this is likely not to be the operational direction that the Russians would take, and as they would be en route to 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 joining into Sovietsk, in a, in a Kaliningrad Oblast, which is a um, which is another interesting interesting thing to observe. We also looked at uh, at NATO EFP um, dislocations, you know, Tapa and Adagi, which is Adagi, as you said, is this tendency to defend uh, the capital, right, the Riga, and and then Rukle. Um, what what do you think about the current dislocation of those forces and their and their status, as in the numbers? Uh, how adequate? Okay, so a, a couple things to think about. First of all, um, the Russian. Russian troops move by rail, so they're gonna they're gonna come down the rail line if they can. That would be their first priority because then they could they could potentially just open the corridor, cross cross Lithuania. They wouldn't have it even to go. They won't have to take on any capital. Any no, none of the three capitals would have to be touched in the Baltic states, and they could achieve mm-hmm. their objective to get to Kaliningrad and just defend that rail line, which kind of goes in a somewhat mm-hmm. northeast easterly direction. Um, so you know that to me, that's kind of that's what I think they would do. Now, obviously, everybody has different opinions, and no one knows what their plan is exactly. Um, uh, refresh my memory. Was it was the other part of the question? Um, uh, the, the the numbers, the sheer numbers of of, of the assets, allied assets. Yeah, in the, yeah. In the so, so so that's the thing to keep in mind. So we talk about you know we have a brigade that we keep ready. U.S. brigade that we keep ready, and it rotationally deploys quite often, and things like that. And if you talk to those guys, they're trained and ready, and read articles about them. But in the end, the Russian forces they're going to face have their order of battle is an order of magnitude larger. They got ten times as many troops, they got ten times as many tanks, they have a lot more artillery, and they have a very robust and capable electronic warfare system. And, and so in many cases, they have quite an advantage. So I know we have loyal, dedicated uh, soldiers in the U.S. Who, who are trained to be their best, and I know they'd be a formidable uh, force to f- oppose them, but they're just going to get overwhelmed with a 10 to 1, you know, 10 to 1 advantage in tanks. I don't care how good you are. Ultimately, they're, they're, sure. you know, it's going to be very difficult. <laughs> second, second to bear in mind is in the early day of any conflict, the Russians will ex- exercise an aerospace operation, which will – the combination of uh, ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, their, ta- their tactical and strategic bombers, um, their electronic warfare capabilities, both from strategic assets and embedded within those brigades and armies that are coming forward. And all those will be out there to basically do everything possible to shut down NATO air. And, uh, and so will you be able to get close enough or will you just be scrambling to avoid getting your aircraft blown up on the ground? How much warning will you have? So in the early few days, the idea that there will be an ability to reinforce or defend or, or come in together, I, I don't know that we can really do it. I mean, all our games have kind of shown that this is a huge problem. And, uh, you know, I know people want to mm-hmm. buy F-35 and things like that. But, you know, we have to really think through um, not just the systems that we buy, but we have to think through, like I said, it really needs a net assessment to think through how the war might likely happen and what you can do to counter it and what you'll be presented with. And a lot of times we may be buying and putting in place forces which are not really the right thing to prevail, particularly in the early time. Um, so that's why mm-hmm. my, my general assessment is that you'll you'll be overrun initially and you'll have to push them out. And even when I advocate, as I said earlier, even when I advocate for things like military mobility and the ability to have the right infrastructure in the right place, um, uh, you know, kind of two aspects of that. One is that military mobility is something that takes, you know, putting in new and enhanced rail lines and things like that. These are things that take five or 10 years or more to fix. So they're not really going to have, they're not going to help you in the near term. However, sometimes supporting infrastructure could be. So putting, uh, you know, pre-positioned forces or not necessarily forces, but at least the equipment that then rotational forces can roll in on. I think that's very important. So even in my mind, the whole, to me, I, I, I never. I, in fact, I told this to some leaders in Poland. I said I never would have gone after the base. I know I didn't think you're ever going to get it. 
I would have gone after the prepositioned forces in the right place and then a new rotational strategy. The ATS. Mm-hmm. No, well, not, no, I mean something different. I'm talking about, I'm talking about <clears throat> having everything a brigade needs to roll in on to in place in Poland. Uh, you know, forget the mm-hmm. base. The, that people don't need to be there. They just need to get there. And then you can fly them in on emergency notice and put them with their equipment and be ready to go. Um, and that would be something that was, uh, in my mind, more politically viable with the United States. I think we sort of ended up in the end with kind of what I thought was going to happen. But um, huh. So you say you're not happy with the, with the APS, Army Preposition Stocks, like like Povitz. This isn't still, still that. Um, I'm not sure what you mean exactly. I'm just saying that I would put more emphasis. The things that you can do, what I'm trying to say is what can you do quickly? Quickly, you can pre-position mm-hmm. forces. You can move tanks from the U.S. to Poland. You can move, you can move other types of artillery. You can pre You can ammunition. You can fairly inexpensively construct shelters that maybe you can do in you know six months. Not you know. I'm just trying to look. What are all you know? If if you think you face a potential conflict in the near future, what are the things you can do quickly? That's what I think you have to look at mm-hmm. quickly. You can move forces. You can take tanks that maybe are not being used in the U.S. and put them in the right place, maintain them, that sort of thing. Um, you can mm-hmm. um, you can put ammunition in in good places. You can build inexpensive shelters. Again, I'm looking for short-term wins, which bolster your capability, allow you to be there quickly, and then apply some deterrence by the fact that they're there. And then that way, you can you can be ready for these things when they happen. Mm -hmm. another interesting interesting topic when it comes to those rapid actions one can take in a in a heightened heightened uh, tension state is um uh as you which is again something you mentioned in your text is uh for example organizing mobilization in ukraine or organizing training in ukraine with ukrainian forces which again i would imagine has some sort of fixing effect right this forces russians to um, devote at least part of their, their their force to 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 countering this potential threat. Um, uh, there is this thing, and then, I don't know if you heard, you definitely heard about the Polish military training in Sarema Island, in, in the Baltic Sea off the coast of Estonia, and stationing NSM missiles over there as a, as a snap exercise. Do you see Do you see this as a, as a, as a right step in the right direction? And, and what else would you do in that, in that strategic signaling kind of, kind of department? Right. So, I mean, I think that's what I'm talking about. I mean, I, I did this thing with Estonia. I, did, I talked to one of your deputy chads about that. And so I think that's, again, those are all, those are all steps and pieces of a puzzle. But what isn't, what isn't laid out is a comprehensive look from along the entire front. So, for example, I gave an example earlier. Well, if you thought there were indications or warnings that Russia might be deciding to do something, you could launch all these things at once. I think Defender 2020 is a good first step. But how about instead of focusing on a training exercise like that, how about focusing on getting every country along that alliance all to take an action all at the same time, different actions at different places, all of which would stretch uh, not just to the limit, that to, it, would, it would break Russia's ability. They would know we do not have the force to counter all these actions at the same time. We simply don't have it. Mm-hmm. Meaning that, hey, if you want to start, if you're really going to start moving into Ukraine again, you know, Finland may just walk across your border, you know, and you couldn't stop it. Or, you know, if you put all the mm-hmm. combined, they practice all the time now, the air, air power across the northern part of, of uh, Norway, Sweden, and Finland, they practice on a regular basis. I mean, you know, you could put at risk their whole strategic deterrent up in the northern part of uh, Russia could be put in risk by that air power if they if they didn't, uh, you know, again, I'm not sure you want to take on their nuclear things, but maybe their their conventional forces up there could be put at risk. Uh, and the fact that that can mm-hmm. all happen uh, quite easily in a coordinated way, but I don't see the I don't see the person who has that job. We have NATO. We have EU, we have partner nations. I don't see anyone who has that job to put it all together. And that's what's missing. Mm-hmm. I mean, when we have these European American and- security dialogues, we try to invite people from all the, all this perspective to be together. And frankly, I often hear from them, you know, we never really ever get together and think like this. NATO certainly does on certain parts of the problem, but that's not everything. There's other people and players that are involved here. 
this is I remember my conversation with um, General Hodges and his talk of military Schengen of the of the immediate really need to to establish some sort of some sort of uh, mechanism that would uh, mirror the the Schengen zone, but for military military uh, movements. Then there is the final part of it of of, of this um of this jigsaw puzzle. And that would be Belarus, which which springs to mind again because of the recent uh, dispute with Russia they're having over over oil, over delivering oil to Belarusian refineries. But also, I don't know if you heard the recent interview of Lukashenko with Echo Moskvy, the the radio station, which was quite unique in its own right. And uh, apart from humorous aspects of it, uh, he also mentioned, for example, that, uh, well, he said that he's aware that for for Belarus uh, that that for Russia Belarus is far more important than certain other regions of Russia proper, which I think shows certain understanding that he has of the region. But also he mentioned that um, that for example Russia is not paying a penny for stationing its troops in in Belarusian territory. How, how would you imagine what is the role of Belarus and how would it change? How would the situation? First of all, what is the role? How would how would its territory play into 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 this whole equation in terms of conflict, and how would the strategic situation change? Shall Belarus fall fall closer to to Russia? Okay, so um, you know, first of all, Belarus, if they're on the Russian side, gives them a measure of strategic depth that they they don't have in other places. I mean. Otherwise, we're at the border. Um, you know, the Baltic states are right there. Finland's right there. Um, you go south, Ukraine, and so on. They're right there. Um, <clears throat> so they do they do get some strategic depth out of it. In terms of the bases in Belarus, um, those are really not. They're not. I don't really consider them to be bases. The functions at the bases in Belarus have already been duplicated on Russian soil. And in fact, uh, there's a lot of concern. For, you know, if you talk to Belarusians, they're they're more concerned about the jobs they get from operating those bases and whether Russia will continue to do that, because um, it's not clear they really. I mean, those fu- the function I, I, again, the functions there have been implemented inside of Russia territory, so they don't really need to have that asset there. Um, but which way mm-hmm. Belarus is going to blow on this thing, I, I simply don't have a clue. In all honesty, actually, what what has made more my attention lately with Belarus is how they're getting very close to China. Um, you know, we, we, hmm. we because of the because of the leader's activity there, we have a lot of sanctions there, and there were a number of uh, economic uh, uh, partnerships that we have with Belarus, all of which got killed by the sanctions, and so they're kind of left economically. What do we do? Do we partner with Russia? We're dependent on them, or maybe China? So the current, there's currently a lot of effort from China to uh, do some work there. Um, but on the other hand, if they fully get integrated in, I mean, one one theory is that uh, the way Putin sticks around for longer is uh, is he adds Belarus back into the Russian Federation, but thereby, in a sense, recreating a USSR again. In which case, then he can be the head of the new the USSR and. Uh, and somebody else can be the president of uh, of uh, Russia, and uh, they rule over this new uh, new reconstitution of the of a Soviet Union like uh, like kind of government. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's another potential thing that would go there. But I, you know, I don't know. I, I find I've been there. I've talked to them, and I, I just don't. I'm confused in terms of where it would go, what would happen. I think it's kind of a. Uh, what do they say? It's a Henry Kissinger description of the Middle East. It's a dilemma. No, okay. you can't solve the problem. Uh-huh. There's not a problem you can solve or even clearly quite understand. It's just going to be a mess forever. All you can do is try to manage it as mm-hmm. best you can. Um, but I don't think, I think from what I've seen in Belarus, they're, they would love to lean west if they could. And uh, But then I, I'm sort of, I'm not one who really agrees with sanctions as an effective strategy. I think it's just... It kind of it's been counter effective. Yeah, I think yeah. I find it to be counter effective generally. Or, or I mean, you know, it's mm-hmm. one thing to come in and lay sanctions for six months or so, but if you didn't achieve the effect, you might as well just quit and try to find something that's mm-hmm. more uh, proactive. That that uh, you know, I mean, at this point, I think we're driving, we're somewhat driven Belarus to be tighter with the Russians and and now with China than if we kind of dropped all that and said, well, let's suck you into the West. By getting you involved economically, I think they'd rather jump on that proposition than the other way. But 
That's my. Do you, wouldn't you think that Russia? Uh huh. Because I would imagine that uh, uh, from the Belarusian side, the willingness to reapproach with China is also because they are they are concerned about uh, Russian encroachment. Uh, um, but but I. Uh huh. I know. I, I mean, my sense is it's really more economic. I, I think it's more economic mm-hmm. with, with China. They're just they're just looking for options. Not to be, I think, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I don't think it's a military alliance, but it does help them not to have to be as dependent on Russia for their economic situation. But anyway, I think that needs a. This is one that needs some true, uh, some true uh, international affairs experts, policy experts, to really think through what's what's really the right way to go. And I'm not sure I'm qualified to comment that much on it. Fair enough. I mean. Poland in general, yeah, the, the the policy, unfortunately, Poland had to, towards Belarus for many years, and the West in general has been has been sort of lackluster. But um, anyhow, this this has been a great part of the uh, on the on the conventional deterrence. Um, I will now get a timeline footnote. Unless you want to add something, is there is there something you would like to add further to uh, this? No, the only thing I wanted to mention is on the military mobility. You mentioned Ben Hodges. And I've been working with him on a number of, of fronts, uh, but on this mo- military mobility issue, um, he's been very concerned about it for a long time. And so he is going to organize a conference in Brussels at the end of, uh, or I shouldn't say conference, it's going to be a roll up your sleeves workshop at the end of March, early April in Brussels to try to get at this. And it's going to be, and I believe that uh, Yasek has agreed to participate. There'll be five working groups looking at different regions and trying to work up solutions in terms of what really can be done. And the idea is that everybody gives lip service to military mobility. There is a lot of money, you know, in the EU in particular with the PESCO initiative supposedly to go towards this, but the, you know, actionable recommendations are lacking because there hasn't been any really good analysis of what is needed. And, uh, and the other concern is that what will happen is the, the things that get funded is what is in everybody's economic best interest, which is nothing wrong with that, but may or may not. Uh, that may or may not, though, help with the military problem. Um, so uh, I'm hoping that mm-hmm. this will be kind of a kickoff of really getting that issue to the forefront. Mm-hmm.